forgive me, a uh, person whom I will call the godmother of uh, gender research. Um, <clears throat> we're going to hear from Nancy Hopkins, um, who also has just returned from Ireland. Um, I don't know whether you get in last night or not, as I did, but um, Nancy just received an honorary degree from Trinity College in Dublin. Um, she's a molecular biologist. She's the Amgen um, Professor of Biology at MIT, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, um, and the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I guess the National Academy of Engineering hasn't found you yet. <laughs> they have an even worse record than being engineers. Um, Nancy is particularly known for her research because she identifies genes that um, are required for development using zebrafish as the model um, and has done a lot of work on bacteria and the uh, lambda virus and has even worked on mouse tumor viruses so she's sort of covered the biological spectrum. But I think what she's really famous for is um, doing the important study where um, I do remember Nancy being on the New England Accreditation Review way back and, and knowing how difficult things were for women students. But she took a tape measure and went around and measured the lab space and she analyzed the who was getting money to travel and so forth and so forth. All the things that really allow someone to advance in a career and produced a report. A um, couple of that that uh, Chuck Vest actually took very seriously, but uh, but I think there's a couple of other things I'd like to mention because they're terrific. She worked in the lab of the Nobel laureate uh, Christian Nisslein Bolhard, and a Nobel laureate who is I met because we were on a board together in in, in uh, Italy, but sh she de uh, devoted her. Nobel Prize money to a fund for women for house cleaning and domestic support. I thought that was fantastic. So um, with, the, with that introduction, and there's more I could say, but I want to hear, from, we all want to hear from you, Nancy. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, I assume, Carla, for the title, which you made up, which I like a lot. And I added a subtitle to it, two leaks I'm going to talk about in the biology pipeline. We've actually already heard about one of them, so that's going to really help to shorten my talk a little, I think. But I thought I would begin with a brief history to put these two stories in a context. So uh, once upon a time, long, long ago, I was just a molecular biologist. <laughs> but 15 years ago, MIT published an article in its faculty newsletter entitled A Study on the Status of Women Faculty in Science at MIT. Yeah. And this article summarized a very long report written by a committee I had chaired a few years earlier. It was set up by then Dean of Science Bob Bergenot at the request of the tenured women faculty in the six departments of science at MIT. These women were highly successful scientists, but they'd come to understand that they had encountered obstacles that men in science don't, and that these obstacles might very well contribute to the small number of women faculty in STEM fields. Our committee identified five general problems that women scientists encountered. So young women reported that it was much more difficult duh, for women than men to manage a family and a career. In fact, when we began our work 20 years ago, it was so strongly believed that a woman could not have children and be a great scientist that women were afraid to take family leave. Only men took family leave. They used it to start companies, do more work, not take care of children. Women didn't take it. More than half the tenured women didn't have children. We documented unequal distribution of resources and rewards to senior women faculty, including less space. I should say the tape measure now resides in the MIT Museum. <laughs> uh, less department support for staff and students, greater payment of their own, all those things, and of course, lower pay. There had never been a female department head in science or engineering in the history of MIT. The percent of women faculty was very low when we started. It was 8%. The word that came to sum up the experiences of women faculty as they progressed through their careers was marginalization. 
Today, we really realized that what we had discovered, rediscovered, was unconscious gender bias, which had already been very well documented by psychologists, but we didn't have to know about it at the time. We rediscovered it. This faculty newsletter article was reported on the front pages of the Boston Globe and the New York Times in 1999, and the reaction truly astonished us. We learned that although we had studied the professional lives of just 24 women, this report described the lives of professional women scientists all over the un United States, and in fact, as we found out, the world. The president of MIT who had endorsed the report was deluged by thousands of emails a day from women saying, this is my story too. The dean of science found himself on the evening news discussing the report, much to his surprise. And a few weeks after the report came out, I found myself at the White House where President and Mrs. Clinton urged all universities to do similar studies. I truly had thought that nobody would ever care about a handful of women who just wanted to do science, but they did. Uh, the president of MIT, as Rita said, Charles Vest, was called upon by various organizations around the country to fix this problem for the United States. <laughs> who, me, he said. <laughs> Uh, he invited the presidents of eight other universities to come to MIT and commit to doing studies like the MIT report and to, meeting, uh, to meet thereafter and share results. And that organization became known as the MIT-9 and continues to meet and share information. But most important, he said, we need to fix MIT. So how do you make permanent institutional change to eliminate gender bias issues? So this slide shows the structure. Uh, MIT's got a pretty simple structure, which helps a lot simple uh, administrative structure. There's a president, a provost, and then there are five schools of MIT, and each one has a dean, and below that are the department heads. And there are six departments of science and eight departments of engineering. So what President Vest did was establish gender equity committees in the other four schools of MIT to do studies like the one that we've done in science. And then, very radical at the time, uh, this is about a dozen years ago, he created a committee called the Council at the highest level of the administration, and he appointed me to co-chair it with Provost uh, Bob Brown, who's now the president of Boston University. That council included the deans of science, the dean of engineering, the chancellor, and of course the provost, and Chuck Vest himself came and sat in with us whenever he had time. Um, I established a committee called the Committee of Chairs, and I met regularly with the heads of these committees. So, we had a network that took problems from the faculty level directly up to the top of the university where policy could be made. And the idea behind it was it's so hard and so slow to change an institution that you needed a faster mechanism, and this was what he established. But looking back on it now, you can see that this is an enormous commitment of university resources to take these high-level people. We met a lot <laughs> over several years. And uh, I think it was a hugely effective mechanism, and it showed the tremendous commitment that Chuck Vest made to this issue. Looking back, I find that the lesson that uh, I learned above all others, and I think we all did, was this one, that time alone does not change anything. People change things, and it takes an amazing amount of work. And a subset of rule one, I think, is if you stop doing this work, progress stops, and you can actually go backwards. <laughs> so enormous progress was made on all of those uh, five areas that I mentioned. So today, essentially all junior women faculty have children, thanks to three new family leave policies that came about by discussion through the university with all department heads, all women faculty, with the council, and that uh, were then written into policy, and include automatic extensions if a woman uh, has a child before tenure. So what was not possible, take a family leave, get tenure, have a child, <laughs> is now routine, and it's like no different from taking really a sabbatical leave. There are also three new daycare centers on campus. Uh, major thing. I mean, they would never mention babies ever before this. Now, babies are crawling everywhere. <laughs> and men, young men and women are pushing babies all over the campus. It's, it's just, just, I just, still can't get over it. I'm just amazing. Okay, so the inequities, as Chuck Vesado said, inequities, that's easy. We know how to fix that. And of course, by tracking data and keeping track of it, you can. I think this year, the Chronicle of Higher Education reported that MIT is one of the few universities where men and women actually earn the same salaries. <laughs> Who knew? Um, 
there had never been a woman department head, now there's been uh, department heads in earth sciences, chemistry, biology, and even mechanical engineering, no longer astonishing, although it's still hard to find them with the low numbers. The president who came after Vest, of course, was a woman, which was not imaginable when we started. But today, uh, I'm going to talk primarily about the last two issues, the numbers, which we heard about from Teej, and what I was really encouraged by that presentation, and the marginalization of women faculty. So these are the two examples of the leaky pipelines. Okay, so numbers, numbers of women. Before the 1960s, as you know, there were essentially no women on the faculties of American universities because they couldn't be hired. Then, beginning in the 1950s, women were encouraged to go into science, I was one of those people, to help beat the Russians. Then 1963 came Betty Friedan's book that launched the women's liberation movement, and of course in 1964, the Civil Rights Act made it illegal to deny women jobs in organizations that receive federal funding. This slide illustrates what I just said for science departments at MIT. What this shows is the number of women faculty in the six departments of science at MIT as a function of time. And the number of men is written across the top for a few selected years. The total number of faculty is fairly constant at about 270, so the shape of the curve does not reflect changes in the size of the faculty. In 1960, there were zero women faculty in these six departments. By 1970, after the Civil Rights Act, there were two. Then the curve suddenly jumps by a factor of 10 to get up to about 20 to 22 women. What caused that such a, how is it possible to have such a steep increase so quickly? Turned out the Civil Rights Act was not sufficient to cause universities to hire women at a reasonable pace, so affirmative action laws were enacted. Universities had to have a plan to hire women or risk losing their federal funding. In the mid-1960s, after 1964 and the Civil Rights Act, people assumed it would take about 30 to 40 years before women would comprise half the faculty of the university. But 30 years after the Civil Rights Act, when our committee began its work at MIT, women comprised just 8% of the science faculty at MIT. At Harvard, it was a whopping 5%. In fact, by that point in time, National studies had already shown that although more and more women were entering the STEM pipeline and getting PhDs, they weren't emerging as faculty, the famous leaky pipeline. So what made this curve jump again at MIT? Even before the findings of our committee were made public, Dean Bergenau decided the answer to the problems that women faculty were reporting was more women faculty. So he identified exceptional women by going around and asking department heads and various scientists Tell me some great women scientists. And then he hopped on an airplane to aggressively drag them to MIT. <laughs> he recruited them. He stalked them. He went after them. Um, and up the curve went. Now, Bob Bergner became so famous, he himself was recruited away from MIT. <laughs> and would you care to guess when he left? <laughs> you got it. The curve went immediately flat. It rose again when a new dean came in and appointed an associate dean, Hazel Siv, to address this issue. And she established training for search committees to overcome unconscious bias that can prevent women of equal or greater accomplishment from being hired. And she introduced other checks on the process, and the curve went up again. So for me, this graph is a fantastic example of rule one. <laughs> Time alone doesn't change things. And even goodwill and good intentions are not sufficient. As we've just heard, you have to know what you're doing, you have to know why it's happening, and then somebody has to make it happen. And um, I'm, as the more I learned about this problem, the more I became a big supporter of even the word, dreaded word quotas, not quotas, but you know what I mean, that um, I'm a big believer in big sticks, <laughs> so <laughs> what do I say? Okay, now a question that comes up immediately is what happens to quality when you make a conscious effort to hire women faculty? From the start, from the 1960s, the tenure rate for women and men in science and engineering at MIT has been the same, the same rate of, of tenure. Obviously, at a place like MIT, you can't lower the standards at the faculty level. It would be a complete disaster. If you look at the tenured women faculty who raised these issues at MIT, most of them, people like myself, were hired probably as a direct result of affirmative action laws. So let's look at the quality of those 16 women who brought this issue to MIT's attention and are responsible for what happened there. Of those 16 women, four of them have won the US National Medal of Science. 11 of them are members of the National Academy of Sciences. No slouches they. <laughs> okay. 
And these are the numbers for all of the science faculty men. And I do not mean to imply that the women are better than the men. These numbers are too small to be statistically significant. You'd have to compare by field, et cetera. But hey, they're good enough. And after all of those three affirmative efforts to increase the number of women, here again are the percent women in the National Academy versus men at MIT. So I think it's fair to say that it's a question of actively seeking out these people, bringing them to a great institution, and then they're going to do well. So where are we today after all of this effort um, at MIT? And here is the answer. Today, just 19% of the science faculty and 18% of the engineering faculty are women. Importantly, though, um, thanks, I think, to the efforts really of Hazel Siv, the percent of women faculty, well, and many people going back over many years, Bob Bergeneau and all of these efforts, the percent of women faculty in STEM departments is the same as the percent of women in the applicant pools to those departments, implying there's no bias in the hiring, and that's, we consider a great step forward. But then why is the percent of women faculty still so low? And there are two reasons. So this data is, again, from MIT, and I think it helps to make it pretty clear. So there's a list of the six departments of science and the eight departments of engineering. And then in the middle column, it shows the percent of women faculty in each department. And over here is the percent of uh, PhD coming out of those same departments who are women. And I think this is a rolling 15-year rolling number. And the reason is because the numbers in any one year are too variable to really make so it's rolling. And I think this is a pretty good pipeline number to use because if you look at comparable universities, they tend to be comparable. And having good data is non-trivial to come by, as those of you know who do this kind of stuff. And MIT's data is superb, so I'm uh, using MIT data here. So what you see, if you look at this, the departments fall into two groups. Um, the red ones, okay, such as brain and cognitive sciences or physics, the percent of women on the faculty is the same as the percent of women PhDs, so there's no leak in the pipeline. The problem is, in many of these red departments, physics, mechanical engineering, computer science, the percent of women getting PhDs is very low. At MIT, of course, these are very large departments. So the overall percent of women is low, and it's going to stay low for a long time, okay? If you look at the total percent. In the other six departments, the black ones, the pipeline leaks by about half. So that would be biology, chemistry, earth sciences, math, um, and bioengineering. So that's the second reason that the percent of women faculty is low. This is the leaks. Now, uh, this is Bob's already, already talked about this. Um, why did the pipeline leak? And honestly, in most cases, we don't know. For many years, I've listened to people, all kinds of speculation. Women don't like this, they don't like that, blah, blah, blah. But actually, I agree that the first substantive result we've actually seen that you've, in, in the case of biology, is, is the case of biology and the paper he alluded to by Jason Scheltzer and Joan Smith. So who's Jason Scheltzer? Why didn't the rest of us figure this out? Jason Scheltzer is a graduate student at MIT in the biology department. I didn't know him. Um, works in, in Angelica Amon's lab. Joan Smith is a recent MIT undergraduate who now works at Twitter. And they happen to be friends. So they wondered, how come there are so many more biology graduate students than there are biology faculty? And they did the simple thing of, of saying, um, using not MIT data at all, but something I wouldn't have had the courage to do, I think. But anyway, they did it, and it was brilliant. They simply looked at the junior faculty of the top roughly 40 departments of biology in the United States, say, where do these people come from? And then uh, uh, who trains them? And that's when they discovered the fact that uh, Tej mentioned, which was that the percent of women faculty in the top biology departments in the United States reflects the percent of women postdocs in these so-called feeder labs. And 83% of feeder labs uh, run by these elite male post uh, PIs and these labs only have 31% female postdocs, whereas female-run feeder labs have 42% versus this. So the biggest leak from PhD to faculty is caused by the exclusion of women as postdocs in these high-achieving male-run laboratories. So um, 
I asked Jason, so I had lunch immediately with Jason, I was so amazed by this, what produced this man? Um, he's remarkable. He's just totally bothered by this. He said, this is unacceptable. I asked him what he thought the reason was. He said, well, it's the fault of these men who are running these labs. They should be out recruiting exceptional women. But I agree with Teach. We don't know why that number looks the way it does. We have no idea whether it's, I mean, I think people, you know, is it in the applicant pool to the lab? People take the best people who apply, and, and if they're not getting applicants, they're not getting, so what is the answer to that? Because that is a profound result. Um, anyway, uh, if you wanted to increase the numbers, you'd have to solve, uh, in science in general, and certainly in biology, you'd have to address these problems. The small pipeline in, in eight of the 14 departments, the leaky pipeline in the other half, and this issue of the biology feeder labs. But for sure, we know time alone isn't going to change that. It's going to take the kind of analysis I was just delighted to hear that Howard Hughes is doing to look into that problem. So now I'm going to turn to the second week, uh, my last topic, which is the topic of um, marginalization and exclusion of women from professionally important activities and the absolutely astonishing case of biology, biotechnology startups by university faculty. And so this is leak number two. And it's an example, I believe, of what professional activity or what happens when a professional activity is not monitored by the university and discrimination, or I guess we can politely say unconscious gender bias, operates unimpeded. I'm not sure this is unconscious. We can discuss this. I'm dying to see what you think about this. Okay. So I think we can sort of agree that in biology, there really is not a serious pipeline problem. At MIT, 70% of undergraduate biology majors are women, 7 0. 53% of PhD students, 41% of postdocs, 26% of the faculty, 38% of the neuroscience faculty. But about two years ago, a woman from Harvard Business School came to see me. She had seen a list of scientists in the Boston area who were funded to start biotech technology companies by a single venture capital firm. These were mostly science professors, although some might have come through pharma or biotech itself. The list had 100 names on it. How many women do you think were on the list of 100? <coughs> One. You got it. <laughs> so she wanted to know how was this possible in the field of biology. The argument for similar data in Silicon Valley has long been that the reason so few women are founders and board members of startup companies there is that so few women get PhDs in computer science. But obviously that cannot be the answer in biology. I mentioned this interesting observation to a woman on the MIT Corporation. She asked me to look into it, so I collected some data. I did what Jason and Joan did. I just went to the web and typed in the names. She kept calling me up and saying, have you worked on that problem yet? I said, no, I don't work on this anymore. It's not my problem. Okay. She kept calling me up. Finally, just to stop her from calling me, I said, okay, I'll do something. She's a very nice lady. So I went on the web, typed in the names of faculty, just went down the halls of MIT typed in a name and the word company. I was only interested in who was involved in the startup phase of the company, not after it became a big company, but the startup phase, because this is where faculty are involved, and who was on the SABs, the BODs. I became interested in management to some extent after I started to see the data. I sort of knew what to expect, but even I was stunned. Okay, so here are three companies founded by Eric Lander. Okay, one of them is an old company and one of them is a genome company and women driven out of genomics years ago, okay. But the one that really caught my attention was this one called Veristamp because it was founded in 2010 with another colleague, Bob Weinberg. It involves stem cells, which is not a field that I thought Eric Land is particularly well known for. So I went to the web to look up stem cell experts. I found that, in fact, um, first of all, about 25% of the world's experts in stem cells are listed as women. Two of them run the faculty at MIT. In contrast, only one of the people in this company was listed as a stem cell expert. So what it shows you is that being an expert is not the reason that you're asked to join this particular company. So maybe it's because you have to be old or whatever, but actually some of these people are junior faculty just out of graduate school, practically, but just out of postdoc. So is this just an Eric Lander, Bob Weinberg ph phenomenon? So I looked at three companies founded by another MIT professor, Phil Sharp. Um, Biogen of these three, number of men, women. I looked at four companies founded by Bob Langer, 41 men, one woman. 
Well, these men are sort of older. What about companies founded by younger men? Younger men don't seem to be doing much better. What was interesting was it wasn't just the founders, the, it was the SAB, the BOD, the, the women didn't come through off the faculties, which is where these men are coming from, nor did they rise there through biotech or through pharma. I mean, I was pretty astonished by the whole thing. Um, is, is this an MIT problem? What about Harvard, Doug Melton, Company One, Company Two, doesn't look any different. What about Harvard Medical School? No different. Sloan Kettering, some East Coast, West Coast company, you name it, whatever, they aren't there. Okay, so I came up with about 5% participation by women faculty relative uh, to male faculty in the 18 companies I looked at. At this point, I learned there had been a national study by the Kaufman Foundation that produced something around 5 to 8%. Um, so, do women found companies? Um, data are now being collected by MIT. I called around, because I started to share this with faculty, everybody was just terrified, <coughs> but we stopped, asked around to chemistry, biology, we found only one woman, a faculty member, who's founded a company. MIT is now collecting data. I should say that, uh, that the one woman uh, has just founded a second company this week, so this is good. Anyway, I wondered if um, young women were asked to join. Maybe they're too busy and they just declined, so I called all these young women who are we have fantastic superstar women. Not a single one had ever been asked to join. Even the ones who were the stem cell experts listed as the world stem cell experts, they were experts, but they weren't asked to join. All the men who were asked to join were not experts. So this is not about being an expert. It's not about being old. It's not about having a Nobel Prize. It's not about being a member of the National Academy. The women are more accomplished than many of the people on these boards. I, I then thought maybe women are too busy to join. I called all these young women. I asked them if they'd ever been invited to join. Not a single one had ever been asked. <sighs> so there's sort of irony here. Um, this is a map of uh, Kendall Square. And in uh, yellow are MIT buildings, of which I think four are the biology and chemistry buildings that might have given rise to biotech. And I guess the red one is biotech something. So we're, we're now surrounded at MIT by the biotechnology industry. So men leave the campus every day and go out to the biotech and the women stay home. <laughs> um, MIT spent decades and millions of dollars of people's time to achieve equity and full participation for women in science and they did a terrific job in the, within the university. But meanwhile, our colleagues crossed the street to participate in a professional activity that looks at the faculty level, the way universities looked 40 to 50 years ago. We're surrounded by a multi-billion dollar industry in which women at the faculty level and at the top business level are largely absent. And this is what marginalization looks like. This is really what discrimination is. I sent these data to Eric Lander and Phil Sharp and Bob Langer. I don't believe they had noticed it before. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> I just say that because we're talking about data here. Okay. <laughs> Importantly, Eric Lander pointed out it was not his fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's the venture capitalists who are responsible. <laughs> the venture capitalists. Indeed, fewer than 5% poor Eric. Poor wimpy Eric couldn't possibly stand up to those venture capitalists. Uh, indeed, fewer than five percent of the partners of venture capital firms are women. Some firms have existed for 50 years and never had a female um, partner. Does this matter? Yes. There are fields of biology where it would be difficult now to be at the forefront without being engaged with this activity. So yes, it sure does matter. Just as it mattered in universities 50 years ago. It does matter. And if there's one thing we know, time alone is not going to change it. So I began to uh, work on these issues 20 years ago. I have now retired from MIT, and I no longer work on them, except when people like Carla <laughs> pressure me. But I, this is sort of my last talk on this topic. But fortunately, <laughs> you guys do. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> Fantastic. Having started a company six years ago, I've lived through all that and I'll Oh good. Questions. <laughs> questions. Anybody 
One, two, three, good. So, Nancy, I just were wondering in the early days at MIT, did nepotism ever play a role? And I only bring that up because my PhD advisor was a woman named Helen Whiteley. And she could not get in the, on the faculty at the University of Washington because her husband, Arthur Whiteley, was in the zoology department. And it, I think I was her first official graduate student when she finally became on the faculty. And was that in, in any type of element, at least in the early days at MIT? The fact that wives could not be hired? Right, because if their husband was already on the faculty. Um, initially, I think there was a rule against it. Later, it became a perk. You could only get it. <laughs> and now we've moved into yet another phase of it where you try to look at it objectively. It's a complicated issue. Um, yeah. Well, you are an absolute inspiration, Nancy. You're amazing. <laughs> One of the things I would uh, speak now at noon, I, I'm changing my mind as I'm listening to the talks about what I'm going to tell you, but one thing I thought I should say right now is one of the reasons women above and beyond everything else are excluded is because by nature and by training, many of them um, are finding themselves in a situation where they just look and they have nothing to lose, and they say it the way it is. I have been thrown out of three advisory committees <laughs> of three biotech companies. Oh my gosh. So, uh, so it's not I was thrown out. I was invited, I was a member, and when I ask the question, you are what? You are putting these in the patients? Did you do this? was the last time I got invited. So one of the, uh, <laughs> and one of the other guys, a very well-known Nobel Prize winner, um, his statement to me when he had asked me to uh, get something, he looked at me and said, Nina, I hate confrontation. I hadn't even started <laughs> <laughs> to do the, you know, so it may be just peculiar to me, but I don't think so. I think I wasn't confronting anybody. I was just asking questions. And so one of the things that they cannot tolerate is to do what it is they want to do. And if there is dissent, they don't want dissent. And women, by nature, don't have that much to lose. So they dissent. <laughs> so I would like to propose that that is another reason and that you know, it should be encouraged that, especially in these kind of companies, especially in these companies that are doing something with human life and human health, uh, there ought to be a lot more transparency. And there ought to be, you know, so, so what, what happens, I see that there's only one or two women who will not, who will not dissent, who will basically go along for the virtue of being on the board. So, my experience. <laughs> Well, those are terrific comments. I mean, uh, you know, when I started doing this work, all I wanted was 200 square feet of space. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's 20 years ago. Um, I mean, I have to say that my experience is that you, um, without civil rights affirmative action, there wouldn't be a single woman on the faculty of any university. And I kind of uh, came to believe, and I see why Europe now does quotas. I mean, I, nobody loves quotas, but that's how they've done it. It's, it's just that, you know, it's taken 20 years at MIT, or 15 years, 12 years, really, of serious hard work just to get these numbers up to where they are, you know? And it just involves so much work. And it's just a strange problem. I mean, I don't really understand it. And this, is, uh, this shows you what happens when you have no, not, none of that work going on. That's what you get. And that's where we'd be, you know, if we didn't have it. So I'm almost to the point of, you know, uh, not quotas, but something. Because how much time do people have to do this work, you know? <laughs> I don't know, discouraging. But there's so, huge progress. <laughs> so Nancy, first I'd like to make a plea that you not retire from doing these things. <laughs> I think you've been so effective. We need you. And you're full of energy and you should continue. <laughs> um, secondly, I wanted to say that I think the valley of death has uh, in some ways not changed from when I was junior faculty to now that there's not enough child care and different ways of providing support, whether it's a child care facility or funds that go towards child care. And I wish TJ were still here so we could bring that up, that the HHMI, but others as well should make that possible because I think it's very, very hard for, for women with young children. And I think in the, um, the tech world, there is 
serious work to be done. Not quite sure how to approach it. One idea is that it's very important to try and translate one's discoveries to making them available and translate them to the clinic. You need companies. And women need help with that. They don't have the same networking opportunities. And I think universities maybe can make a difference by providing uh, help to women in terms of funds for startups and also counseling on how to reach the VCs. And uh, it's one idea I have. But I wonder how you would propose to change these numbers if we were to be proactive. Well, huh. uh, I think at the breach of Title Seven, Title Nine. I don't know. I mean, these universities. I mean, these companies are using the universities. I mean, the intellectual yeah. property used to be at the NIH, and that wasn't effective, so they transferred it to the universities. So they're using the universities uh, to make these companies. And so, um, I mean, I have literally had postdocs come and cry in my office because the men go into their office with the other people they're doing the companies with and leave the women sitting outside. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable? Unacceptable? Absolutely not acceptable. So if you're going to be a parasite on the universities, you've got to play by the rules. <laughs> and you know, we do have uh, rules. I, I just think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's completely unacceptable. <laughs> What can I say? I did um, mention this to uh, Eric Lander. He said you know, it wasn't his fault. It was the VCs who are responsible for this problem. But if Eric Lander's not powerful enough to use his companies and women on his company, I mean, come on. You could change the VCs. I think you could change that. I mean, I, I just think, but I, it's like all these things. That's why I just, I've come to believe that you know, without civil rights and affirmative action, without some kind of law, I mean, I almost think it's worth a lawsuit. <laughs> against the mm -hmm. universities mm -hmm. until they comply. And, and you yeah. can't have 70% of your students sitting in front of you are women, and then you leave the campus and go off and do this. No, mm -hmm. this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's through the university that you could leverage <laughs> these companies that are being Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the president of MIT, I get, gave this data at a talk, and, and he said, whoa, <laughs> it's not acceptable. And he said he'd do something about it, but I don't know, I mean, it's a tough problem. Molly Cairns, University of Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Nancy, for all that you've done. And make sure Joe handles and knows about this, these data. Um, so I just want to make a comment um, you know, about sort of how social roles affect our thinking, the implicit bias, things like that. So just looking at your data from the way gender functions as a diffuse status cue, this is exactly what you would predict without some outside force preventing it because whenever you talk about high status, i.e. lots of money, whenever you talk about technological things, which again are more implicitly linked to male gender, um, those kinds of things would absolutely be predicted to sort of socialize men toward rising into those positions <coughs> and leave women out, whether through self-selection or so, but thank Thank you so much for drawing attention to it because I agree it's terrible. It is very sad and depressing, but still it was very sad and depressing in the academic uh, institutions 20 years ago. So thank you so much for your work. What well, came from a man, I showed it to I said, what do you think is the explanation? He said, oh, he said, Nancy, you know what that is. Biotech is all smoke and mirrors, and women don't like smoke and mirrors. <laughs> 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 Have they heard of me? Oh, it's, it's also an old boys club. Oh, okay. One last question. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jerry Barrett. Um, I just wanted to say there is a uh, group in Silicon Valley called Astra, and what they are, they're a group of um, venture capitalists who do specifically invest in women-run companies, including biotech. So there are people working on that. Unfortunately, it's on the other side of the country. But one of the things they also do, because women tend not to have the resources or the support, is they actually put together advisory committees. So if you're a woman, you're looking for that kind of investment, they'll come and they'll help bring together the resources you need. So there are groups working on this. Just like tell everybody not to be completely discouraged. but. I do have seen a lot of the research, and there is just huge amounts of unconscious bias, especially at the university level, where a lot of this kicks off because it's, oh, I'm going to start this with my frat brothers. I'm going to start this with the guys I hang out with. And people feel more comfortable with people that look like them, think like them. And what they've seen, especially in the tech companies, is you'll see you know, seven guys, and oh my gosh, they all went to MIT. 
together, and then what do they hire? They go back to MIT and they hire more guys who went to the same classes, had the same professors, and so they just have this perpetual cycle. But you know, it is starting to change in Silicon Valley because gee, it keeps getting written about in the New York Times. Yeah, it's been taking an awful long time. The one yeah. last thing I would say is, I mean, I, I think that. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot. Oh. Oh, I forgot. Well, I, I <coughs> seriously. Okay. Uh, we really urge you to write this up because you presented the data so compellingly that it needs to be printed and it needs to be a, another Hopkins report. Having gone through and started a company, it's all true, and the venture capital side of it is the worst. So I think it really needs to be written up.